You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody, that music means it is time once again for TWIFO, This Week in Futures Options, the program where the name pretty much says it all. We break down the week that was and indeed still is, and oh, what a week it has been and indeed still is on, in all markets right now. So much popping off. We're going to try to come to grips to it for you and indeed with you. My name is Mark Longo from the com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting, ever-necessary Ever exploding these days, Options Insider Radio Network. Love to see the influx of new folks just continuing to discover this program and indeed our network looking for some, some outlets for quality options and volatility and derivatives insight in these troubled times. We got you covered. We got a show for that. So uh, if you haven't subscribed to the full network yet, I know most of you do. Head on over there. Get the full kit and caboodle over a dozen programs you guys can sink your teeth into, ranging everything from volatility to what asset managers should be doing in this environment to education to stuff for active retail to this show to all sorts of other fun stuff in there between crypto. You name it. It's on the network there. So check it out. We got some content for you there, which a lot of people have some time on their hands to enjoy. Like my cohort here, my partner in crime on the old program, Mr. Sean Smith, the managing director of derivatives licensing over there in FTSE Russell. He's doing what we're all doing right now. He is self-isolating, so he is not here in the studio with me eating delicious gourmet burgers. So I do believe he's not in such uh, bad environs. My little birdie's telling me that you're, uh, you're holed up down there in scenic and sunny Florida. Is that the case, Mr. Sean? I am. Um, Mark, thanks for having me on the show again today. Uh, I am. I'm in Florida. You know, I did something a couple of months ago before all of these big conferences that we were supposed to be at together um, were going to be happening. I rented a house down in Florida and, you know, it's uh, with companies making most folks work from home. 
I, uh, I got myself approval to work from the home I rented uh, down here in Florida for the la- for these last two weeks. So it's been it's been nice. I've been kind of locked up in the house, and I'm actually looking out the windows right now at a beautiful 80 degree sunny day. I can see the ocean, but I'm inside, <laughs> and I've been inside during these tumultuous times for a lot of it. So, uh, but it's, it's always good to be here. It's always good to be on the show and, uh, we've got lots to talk about. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Who knew the last time you and I, when you and I sat down together also in Florida, just a few scant weeks ago, that would be the last time you and I would see each other for some time. And also the last time you and I would see pretty much any human for some time. Who knew <laughs> how, how the market times have Who changed. Knew? Yeah. We were so young and innocent back then. No, we were. Yes, we knew so little. But now, oh, how times have changed. And also joining us today to help us make sense of this madness holding down the CME group hot seat, our old friends. We call him the once in future Dr. Vix if he someday ever gets his, uh, his degrees in order. Mr. Russell Rhodes, I'll let him explain what the heck he's up to these days because every time I talk to him, his business card seems to change. Mr. Russell Rhodes, welcome back to TWIFO. Uh, what the heck are you up to these days? I am I am up to a new position. First off, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you sound fine. You sound great. Okay, I just make it making sure. Um uh hey Sean, I'm I'm out in Clarendon Hills. If you want me to drive by your house in Western the place that you live, I won't give you totally away. Uh, I'm happy to check on your house for you. Um feel free and, to and I'm help jealous yourself to you... any of the groceries. Okay. Oh, you know what? Uh, I might break in and take all the toilet paper. Is that okay? <laughs> so I'm hearing there's uh, I'm hearing so, there's a mad rush for the toilet paper. I know. It's nutty <laughs> out here. So uh, just uh, back to Mark's question. Um, I have shifted over to a firm called EQ Derivatives. Uh, I'm head of research and consulting for EQ Derivatives. Uh, a good friend of Sean and mine, a gentleman named Pat Fay, used to have this position, and I took it over about a week or so ago, uh, which is uh, focusing a lot more on volatility and alternative risk premium and things like that. Could you think of a better time to be looking at things like that in the market? I cannot. So without further ado, let's get to it. Let's start as we always do, listeners. And of course, you guys, as always, can follow along, play the home game. And I think a lot of you are playing home games right now, so we'll add one more to the mix. You can play the home game at twifocmegroup.com. Slash Twifo is the place to go to generate those reports, not just during showtime and not just when you're listening to the podcast. That works all week long. So if you have a question, what is up in copper today? Or I want to check out on those lean hogs, see what's going on out there. Seemegroup.com slash Twifo is the place to go to begin your journey. And, you know, it's another week. Mr. Rhodes, you're Mr. Director of All Things Research now over there. I'm curious if you... If you back up my my uh, hypothesis here, but I've been saying for a while now that you know I only used to say it only half jokingly, but really now it is it is fully serious. Uh, the notion that if you are let's say an asset manager out there and you're sixty percent in long equities and you're thirty percent in fixed income and maybe you get crazy, you put a little ten percent in gold, right? Uh, that you've done your due diligence of those other asset classes. Those are inversely correlated. You've hedged. You diversify. We've seen it. Time and again, and it's playing out again this week, just more recently yesterday. Uh, when it all hits the fan, listeners, that correlation moves pretty much to one. So these quote-unquote safe haven assets, these, these flight to liquidity, flight to quality type assets like gold and your treasuries, getting annihilated just like everything else. That just proves the old adage that when it all hits the fan, the correlation goes to one. Unless you have some volatility in your back pocket or a very strict directional type hedge like a put on a specific strike. Those are things you can rely on. Those are things you know what their correlation is. You know what they're going to deliver. Outside of that, everything else is pretty much a crapshoot. And in times like this, when you don't want them to be, when everyone's panicking for the exits and trying to get cash and liquidating, they're selling everything. That's when your gold is selling off. That's when your everything else is selling off that you were relying upon in your portfolio. Mr. Dr. Vix. Do you concur with that as well, that we're in that correlation going to one phase and maybe the old notions of standard portfolio theory and diversification, which I think you teach in one of your other jobs? <laughs> Those are kind of going the way of the dodo, sir. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's the whole uh, diversification is great until you really want it thing. They even acknowledge that and teach that in the CFA program, which uh, any of you that were studying for the CFA exam – 
uh, you can put that on hold. They've actually delayed the June exam as of today. Uh, but yeah, it, it's diversification is great, except when you really need it. And then it's everybody's looking at what can they sell to raise some cash. So, you know, alternatives in the form of you know, even just a put option. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people that would have been thrilled if they had bought put options on the S&P 500 uh, or put on even a collar or anything else like that to hedge their portfolio a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, you know, we've said it before. People think we're preaching to the choir because we talk to predominantly options-oriented audience. These days, that audience is even even broader uh, than usual. But yeah, if, unless you have some volatility, particularly equity volatility, in your back pocket for days like these, or you have some sort of hedge in place, a literal hedge like a put or some sort of collar position on your underlying, whatever it may be, you're not really hedged. So bear that in mind out there as we head on out to look at the movers and shakers for the week we had to really look far and wide, listeners, to find green on the screen. Remember, this, this is a scan that goes back to our previous show. So from Thursday to Thursday is when this show runs, or the scan runs. And looking at this, we found all of the upside that we could find. <laughs> it's a total of eight names, listeners, that, were, that had any green in all of the CME Globex community out there this past week. So we're gonna, let's, let's just break them all down because... There's not many. <laughs> Number eight is uh, the Nikkei. That's up a point, paltry, 0.09%. Now you see how far we had to go. Uh, number seven, the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ 100 E-mini actually was up 1.55% on the week. We had a little bit of a rally, and that kind of helped it there. Uh, number six, iron ore, up 2.3%. You still, all these upsides are pretty paltry. Uh, number five, our old friend, Class 3 Milk, once again up there, bucking the trend, up 2.33%. Number four, soybean meal. Going to see a little bit of... Ags dominate in this part of the of the scan here. Soybean meal up four percent even. Number three, wheat up five point six nine percent. Numero dose here, rough rice up seven percent. And number one with a bullet, the pretty much biggest upside mover of the week is KC wheat up eight point oh three percent. Now we move <laughs> to the dark side, and you can check this out for yourself, listeners. Go to the screen. We also tweeted it, I believe. CME tweeting it out there as well. Our, our market scan for the week, so you can see. Pretty much how much of it is dominated by red, and it is pretty much all red. Uh, so let's just break down. Uh, well, we did 10. We could go much farther than that. And you can see even our number 10 to the dark side is moving more percentage-wise than the number 1 to the upside. Number 10 is actually uh, the dollar-peso spread out there, which is kind of interesting. Off nearly 10%, 9.99%. On number 9, copper. Off 12.07%. Number 8, Brent. Going to be a lot of energy in here. Brent. Off 13 and a quarter percent. Heating oil, number seven, off 15.01 percent. Number six, palladium, taking a bit of a break or perhaps a, a dive, <laughs> off 18.56 percent. Our old friend WTI coming in at number five, off 23.7. Think about that, listen. We were already at just completely anemic, appalling lows last week, and we're off almost nearly another 25 percent from there. Just, just process that. Let that roll around in your mind for a minute. Number four, silver. Again, going back to those quote-unquote flight-to-quality type assets, the shiny stuff, silver taking a drubbing off nearly 24% week over week. Platinum also coming in there taking a drubbing off, uh, well, actually a little bit below that. It was off 23.33%. Uh, so platinum actually be switching there with silver for number four. Number two, Arbob, 27.88%. And number one to the dark side, it was up strong. Now it's down strong. Euro dollar is off 46 0.24%. Man, just so much, so much going on. I'd be remiss, though, just given how many of you have been chiming in and writing in and looking at it, and just how absurd, historic, call it what you will, the movements we've seen out there. we, we got to start in energy land out here this week. Before we even get into it, uh, Mr. Rhodes, the once in future Dr. Vix. Now, you've been on this show multiple times. We've talked many times about how the narrative, when particularly when it comes to WTI from a call and from an overall options perspective, is that the calls can't catch a bid. We talked about it when uh, the drone attack happened last year. We talked about it when the Iranian general was assassinated. All these events that should have been precursors to quite a bit of upside in the energy market were completely faded. And now, but did you, could you, could anyone in their wildest dreams have imagined, not just the, the pandemic and the coronavirus destroying demand, which is in and of itself a complete outlier, but on top of that, Adding to the fun, we have this price war unfolding uh, between Russia and OPEC out there that is continuing the plunge 
to the dark side now. We have analysts coming out now. I mean, you know, I take a dim view of analysts, but uh, analysts coming out in actual public media saying crude oil prices could fall below zero, as they're saying, just because this one coming out, uh, this was an analyst from Mizuho Securities saying oil prices can go negative because there is a net uh, $100 million or so barrel a day market. And this stuff has to come out of the ground. It's coming out. And they have to do something with it. So after a certain point, if the physical reality of the market is that oil is pumped out of the ground and has to be consumed or stored, and when that cost of storage gets too high, they could end, or the space gets, it's finite. It could run out. Uh, they, they may have to end up paying customers to take this crude off your hands. Mr. Rhodes, did you ever imagine in a million years we'd be where we are right now in the crude land, sir? I didn't imagine we would be where we are in crude ever. Well, it, you know, like you said, in a million years. But even when the Russians and the Saudis, or I guess it was the Saudis that made the announcement, said that uh, we're going to create a price war and we're going to show you, Vladimir Putin, I don't really, th- I, I never would have thought that we would have hit, you know, like a 20 handle. I think, did we go to a point where we were in the teens? Um, I know we came really close to 20, but still. I, I would have thought the mid twenties would have been the low point. I know we were about five points lower than that yesterday. So even after the announcement that they were going to fight over it, I wouldn't have imagined that we were going to get as low as we got. Yeah, it's just any way you could you could parse it is madness. Sean, I know crude oil not exactly your first stomping ground over there in Russell Land, but even you watching from your safe and indeed tropical and warm isolated location must just be just completely just baffled at what's going on out there in the crude space, Sean. It's, it's, uh, it's incredible. And, and uh, you know, you hear, uh, I, I, I'm sure you guys read the, the headlines today. They say, say that the crude could go even lower. And I'm like, oh, my, how on earth? It's, uh, I'm, I don't think uh, oil has touched it. I remember paying the all-time high for gas when, it, uh, when crude hit its all-time high. What was it, $147 a barrel? The all-time high. Um, I, I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, amazed at uh, at the volatility in this uh, in these products and in, in, in crude itself. It's just uh, um, I, 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 a price war between Russia and Saudi Arabia. I'm I'm, I'm still trying to get my hands around the purpose, um, but it's uh, it, it definitely is crazy times. So uh, very interesting. I'm looking here, Mr. Rhodes. I don't think we broke through the uh, the 20 handle. We got pretty close. I'm looking here. A couple of different charts show me a couple of different levels here. This one's showing you top bottomed out around 21.15 before the rebound bounced out. Also worth noting our buddy, uh, Mr. Schwartz, out there in, in Trade Alert land. Doesn't usually follow WTI, but he was even talking about some longer term. I think they were Jan or 2022 calls uh, an upside vertical someone just loaded up for size. Also, I think someone pointing out one of our uh, one of our Twitter followers that there was a size a buy in the futures right around that level, which really kind of helped one of the few bullish signs we saw that helped turn things around from the brink down there around the 20 handle. Maybe even the Saudis are saying, you know, maybe we got this a little out of hand. Uh, maybe we want to buy some of this back. But either way, this has been just, uh, I think, historic. Doesn't even begin to... We're seeing now, as I say this, as we're seeing the markets rallying, everything else rallying, oil now on, on track to post its best day ever to the upside, up 23%. Uh, so far, so clawing back, uh, looks like about half of the losses from uh, yesterday's uh, sell-off there. So just insanity across the board. If you want to see how insane things are out there, listen, we talked about it before here. The the crude oil VIX, OIV, which is pretty much the VIX of WTI, and been measuring, it's effectively your VIX methodology applied to WTI. So it's taking effectively that front month at the money vol with a little bit of other things mixed in the skew. And a few other things in there. And what you get is uh, this VIX number and or this WOIV number. And we always talk about it. It's usually in the high 20s, maybe into the 30s. Start watching paint. It gets into the 40s. Hey, watch out. It's getting pretty volatile. 50s, forget about it. It's at 163 and a half right now, listeners. So it is, it is off any chart you could even want to talk about at this point. That's just how far we've moved out here in the crude oil volatility. Let's get on out here again to the, uh, to the old CME report, cmegroup.com slash TWIFO. Click on that drop down to energy, then to WTI. That will bring you to where we find ourselves today. If you look at this, this, is, this 
this TWIFO report is this weekend, so it's going to show you pretty much through all the trading days of this week, not back to our show last week like our market scan does. So a little bit different frame of reference there. If you do that, you'll see uh, WTI is still off about nearly 20% from where, where it started the week here, off about 19.65%, still at about a 25 handle, so well off, to almost 26, so well off those lows here. So, yeah, interesting, interesting stuff Then that's for that buying paper came in. The vol here, kind of, as you might imagine, <laughs> up 40 handles in that front contract with one day to go. You get out a little bit far. Let's go out about a couple of weeks. Let's go out to that week one, excuse me, April uh, contract. Has uh, vols up 45 points. So just historic, mind-blowing numbers, uh, however you want to parse them. It looks like so far this week, the lion's share of the paper coming out here in the WTI is in actually the May contract. Looks like about a little over 30%, about 31% of the contract paper going up out there in May. And we're talking about, you know, threatening to break the 20 handle. Well, guess what? The big dance is out here. Well, in May, it's the 20 puts, but actually the largest print for the week is out to June. June 25 puts. Looks like 20, excuse me, 19,000 of these. That's the big print out here. On the week, so 25 puts actually, not the 20 puts as you might have imagined. Uh, let's pull these up here really quickly. The lion's share of these going up actually today, 8,300 going up today. So a big day out there today. About 5,000 yesterday, and about 5,000 again on Monday. Good chunk of that opening. So opening 25 puts out here for the big print number two. 20 puts, go figure out there as well. About 17,700 of those bad boys. The lion's share actually yesterday. That's not surprising. That's where we saw the big dip. 9,200 of those there yesterday opening. Pretty much across the board there as well. Then we get out to 15 puts. 15, one five puts, listeners. That's mind-boggling. 17,000 of those as well. The lion's share of those coming today, 8,300, uh, 6,400 yesterday. Good chunk of that opening as well. Also, the 20 puts active here in May as well with about nearly 15,000. 6,000 yesterday, about 6,500 going up today. Also, slightly biased towards the opening. So 15 puts are active out here in uh, who'd have, we were just talking on this show a couple of weeks ago about the 40 strike and the 40 puts and it seems like that's a pretty that's you're pretty alarmed if you're putting on a 40 put hedge because it seems like breaking through 40 we look at our recent sell-offs a few years ago we didn't get that much below the 40 strike so if you're worried about a 40 strike you're pretty concerned and now here we are talking about 15 strike puts oh how the worm has turned in crude land listeners look at let's look at how that skew is shaping up out here as well. Again, let's go back to that uh, that May contract where the lion's share of the action is. And the puts, not surprisingly, were bid last week. They were about 14.7% rich. They had the money this week, even more bid, 16.1%. You know, as we're threatening these 20 handles and stuff to the downside, you're going to see some put bids kicking in there. The calls can't catch a bid. Go figure. 9.9% cheap last week. Even cheaper this week, 13.1% cheap here this week. So just a... A complete annihilation across the board. Uh, Mr. Rhodes now is your director of all things derivatives or all things research over there. A, has this crude annihilation come across your, come across your radar? And B, if so, sir, what do you make of this just madness? You know, 20 strike puts, 15 strike puts, vol exploding, skew going crazy. What, what's your take on all this madness, sir? <laughs> well, it, it's not just the... You know, just the absolute price and the options you're talking about, man, they're paying up for them. And you, know, you, you mentioned that the calls can't catch a bid when, whenever we would see any negative news in the last six months or so. The calls still aren't catching a bid. Nobody is really concerned about um, any, any rebound in the price of oil anytime soon. Uh, it's like you mentioned, the 20 strike puts, those are people actually, for the most part, stepping up and buying those things to, to guard against a further drop in the price of oil, which is, as, as you mentioned, it's almost mind-blowing. Uh, not almost, it is. It is mind-blowing by pretty much uh, by any measure. Before we head out of energy, really quickly, let's look quickly, too, because it's just there's an annihilation across the board. Nat gas also. Remember, not too long ago, we were talking heading into the winter. Everyone was talking about a dire winter, the worst winter on record, which, by the way, listeners, if you hear them predicting that, you know, fade it because – it never comes to pass. It's always the opposite. They say it's going to be a mild winter like it did in Chicago a few years ago. That's when we had our Chiberia here, just frozen winter that everyone thinks we do, but we don't usually get. And then this year they said it's going to be that. We got a very mild one. And that, of course, hitting that gas. And then, of course, on top of everything else, the energy apocalypse 
uh, wiping things out as well. The Henry Hub contract over there on uh, on the NYMEX hitting its low since August of 1995. Uh, so getting into the uh, one handle now, 1.56 per million metric British thermal units, if you're curious about uh, how that contract is quoted uh, it, hits, it hit prices about 1.39 back in August of 1995, and there are several $1 levels that hit 95 and 94. So that's how far back we have to go. You're talking 25 years uh, to, uh, to see these types of moves after a 14% collapse at this time. Coming into showtime now, let's look really quickly because there are so many complexes that merit our interest in our time this week. Let's just do a quick check-in on that gas because it, it was one of those ones everyone was predicting – was going to be uh, through the stratosphere. So in that case, maybe one of the hardest hits because people had expected so much from it this cycle. And then now uh, the, the combo of demand, weakness, and no one's at work. No buildings are using nat gas uh, for heating or anything anymore. So it's just a uh, just an annihilation out here, kind of across the board. It's also an annihilation, it seems like, on our, on our analytics here. There's so many... So much, uh, so many people sucking down the, the analytics here that it doesn't seem to want to play ball with me right now to pull up everything nat gas. But yeah, things are, are getting annihilated, as you might imagine, listeners. Things are just crushed across the board. Let's see if I can pull that back up. Meanwhile, though, let's keep on rolling here with the show. Mr. Rhodes, as our hot seat guest, where should we hang our hat next, sir? So go to the uh, interest rates. You love <laughs> rates. I, how, how did I know? I always, how did well, I know? no, and actually, no, but there's actually something I want to talk about with respect to rates. I, I did some prep. All right, so. before, before we get there really quickly, my Nat Gas finally is playing ball with me. Nat Gas finally listening to me. Uh, we're seeing the Vol there, as you might imagine, up 17 handles. The biggest contract is uh, the May contract. Once again, 38.4% of the paper. We're at about a 1.662 out there right now. We're talking about three handles and north of that not too long ago. 1.662 is where the future is in that front future. And we're talking the biggest print out here, 38, almost 39,000 of the one and a quarter puts. Yes, one and a quarter puts in May are the biggest print out here. Really quickly, skew, skew, 8.3% bid to the puts last week. This week, 13% puts even more bid, which not exactly surprising. Uh, calls, 9% cheap. This week, 11.2% cheap. All right. Squeeze a little gnat gas in there. Mr. Rhodes, I know you're champing at the bit to get at some rates, so have at it, sir, while I fight with my system to bring up a Eurodollar quote. We'll fight with your system to pull up a Eurodollar quote, but something that I noticed on the, uh, you know, on the volatility term structure for uh, looking at the 10-year, the 5-year, the 2-year, and the 30-year, the 2-year and the 5-year are, are more concerned uh, about it looks like they're more concerned about a little bit of a bounce in rates and a lower uh, lower uh, future price since they move in opposite directions. But at the same time, the 10-year and the 30-year look a lot more like a smile where people are trying to either speculate or get protection against a gain or a drop in um, in the longer dated uh, futures contracts, which are the longer dated rates as well, which I just I, and and I haven't been able to uh, dig enough into the logic there, but it looks like there's more of a concern about short term rates going up uh, than longer term rates going up, and there's equal concern about uh, whether longer term rates are going to go down or go up. So uh, it's unidirectional on the short term stuff and. Uh, more concerned about a big move in one direction or another, but not really picking a direction for the longer dated futures contracts. I thought, that, and basically every other skew chart that I looked at before w- before getting on with you today was really concerned about the downside. Metals, oil, everything except the, the interest rates were the only ones that looked different. I mean, Currencies are their own animal, so you can't really read anything into that one. But of the things that I feel like you can get a read as to what the market may be thinking, um, the interest rate complex just stood out as, I don't know, I don't want to say necessarily having more uncertainty uh, because it looks like it's certain with one part of the curve, but uh, uncertainty with respect to what the curve's going to look like three or six months down the road. Yeah, you know, can you imagine a scenario where rates actually tick up in the near term? <laughs> imagine 
Actually, yeah. I, I think that there's, um, if, if you're a country that, and you're mad at the United States, start selling your, start selling their bonds. That, that, that'll do some damage to the U S and, you know, academically, we always talk about how, uh, there's supposed to be some sort of a risk premium in, uh, interest rates, except for, you know, like, uh, government bonds from the U.S. government. Well, if they keep printing money and throwing it out at everybody, there could be a, a risk premium starting to creep into the uh, the interest or the yield to maturity on different government securities. You know, I'm, I'm pulling up here some rates and I, I have to get out. I have the 30-year up. Not, not as much going up in the 30-year this week as you might think, which you know, that's kind of ex- expected. 30 years, obviously, quite literally a much longer term type instrument. So these Near-term fluctuations don't tend to drive it as much as something we talked about the euro dollar earlier, just getting uh, annihilated off. What is it? Forty odd percent from uh, forty. Where is the number here? Forty. There we go. Forty-six and a quarter percent from from last show out here. So big, big swings out here in all things euro dollar. But one of the big questions too, and we'll get to this later in our questions. We've been talking, you guys, and I guys have a lot of thoughts on this. Is of course we are in a somewhat historic, and you're a, I know you're a history guy. Uh, Russell, from a historical volatility and historical volume perspective, we are in historic, indeed, uncharted waters here from a U.S. options perspective. This is the first time today that really the entire U.S. options market, both on the futures options side with CME and ICE and others, and then, of course, on the equity and index options side with all of the 16-odd U.S. options exchanges, all the trading floors have shut down. NYSE just came in and shut down uh, the Amex and the Picos. Philly already shut down. So Cibo and CME were already shut down. So that means effectively the day that market makers have been dreading since I walked into this business in 1997 is finally upon us where everything is trading electronically. And, you know, one of the big ones that everyone points to is saying, yeah, I can never go electronic is the euro dollar. It is so entrenched from a, a pit trading perspective, and it is so complicated. There's so many months and years and, and series out here. So people kept saying, well, that's, in fact, that was one of the big hindrances to the early days of Globex. They couldn't really make it work for euro dollars. It was so complicated. So this is a beast, and SPX is another one they point to. It's very firmly entrenched on the index side, a firmly entrenched pit crowd there. And both of them have been doing pretty strong numbers this week in a fully electronic format, which – Maybe it doesn't bode well for the future of, of trading floors. I'm looking here right now, listeners. Again, you can find the rates, cmegroup.com slash TWIFO. Go to the rates, go to euro dollars and drop down. You'll see we're on path here this week, listeners, on track for a total of 8.5 million contracts in the euro dollars out here this week. So anyone who says this cannot be done, this cannot be traded electronically, it seems like they're putting the lie to that here. This week, and if you're wondering where the lion's share of the action is, obviously the trading is pretty spread out here in euro dollars. There are so many months and series going out for years, uh, but we got majority here, little almost a quarter, 24 percent going in that front April uh, contract expiring this year. So it has about oh 21 days to go. And if you want, so we're at about a 99.35. If you're wondering out there in the future, out there right now, if you're not someone who follows euro dollars on a, on a regular basis, don't know the price level out there. And we're seeing of the let's see the big print out here. And again, these when I say big, I mean big. These are the, <laughs> the prints in euro dollars, uh, substantially more than we're seeing in other products. Uh, Ninety nine put doing four hundred seventeen thousand contracts. I will say though, individually, that seems like a little bit lighter than we have seen in previous weeks, where we saw one strike doing you know six hundred, eight hundred thousand, close to a million contracts. So maybe there's something to be said for individual uh, strikes not doing as much. It seems like an aggregate though. It seems like the volume is holding up here. Again, the 99 puts pretty much uh, 417,000 yeah, 417, contracts out here. So, yeah, Mr. Rhodes, I know you're my guy to turn to for all things historical data out here. What do you, what do you think about, A, the historic nature of where we find ourselves right now from an overall options perspective here in the U.S., both sides of the market, the equity options, the futures options, all completely electronic, and then B, Euro dollar is one of the stalwarts everyone pointed to, right? I could never go fully electronic. What are your thoughts on what we're seeing out, out there right now compared to what we've been seeing historically? Well, the, the average daily volume on the euro dollar options was just – it was about 950000 last year. Uh, the average daily volume over the first two months of this year were about $1.5 for euro dollars. 
And the number you're throwing out there, just projecting that we're going to do 8 million contracts this week, that means that the euro dollars are holding up fairly well uh, volume-wise, even though they've gone you know, all electronic. Now, in February, they did do around 2.2 million uh, a day average daily volume. But uh, I think uh, you know, we, we were just on the cusp of a lot of uncertainty back then. Uh, now that we've gotten a couple of big rate changes and we're probably in a, a situation where the Fed really can't do anything else rate-wise for some time, uh, you would expect the volume to drop off a little bit. So I wouldn't attribute uh, a slight drop-off this week to moving to electronic. I would just attribute it to, uh, to market conditions. You heard it here first here, listeners. Russell blames any drop-off you might see going forward fully on going electronically and not on, on any other any other conditions out here. We could talk rates, but we got to get other products here going as well. I know Sean's champing at the bit. A lot going on. A lot of you are focused on the endless soap opera, the drama, the hand-wringing that is the equity market. Uh, you know, it seems like we're on a little bit of the green tip today, listeners. But again, wait five minutes. That could change. We have seen pretty much all the rest of this week just annihilation across the board as these coronavirus fears continue to just stoke more downside sell-offs, circuit breakers triggering historic days, you know, days matched only by the 87 crash. These historic numbers, VIX closing at its highest level since 2008 back on Monday. So these levels that are just outliers by any definition of the word, and they're all happening time and again just in sequence is kind of madness. It does seem like we are a little bit on the tail end of the green so far, Today, you know, it's been a bit of a swing. They were up more than 2%. NASDAQ was up nearly 4%. Now coming into the middle portion of the show here, we're seeing the Dow up about 1%. The S&P up a little over 1%. NASDAQ up nearly 4%. And the Russell 2000 uh, moving and shaking. In fact, let's pull that up right now. Again, cmegroup.com listeners slash TWIFO is the place to go for that, listeners. And as I'm digging up all those data for the Russell 2000, Sean, it's obviously been... A tumultuous week for you guys out there. I'm sure all your clients and colleagues, A, as they're dealing with all this home isolation and, and social distancing, to use a euphemistic term. On top of that, they're seeing all this equity tumult going on. You know, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? What are you experiencing as you're talking to the end users, the customers, the clients, the market makers in this all electronic environment? What are, what are you hearing out there, sir? It's, uh, again, it's just crazy times. Um, vol- volatility is, is staying up as, uh, 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 I think, uh, we've been talking about VIX and RVX, uh, kind of trading in tandem and that spread just seems to just stay stuck where it's stuck because of the, uh, uh, the market is just so extremely volatile. In terms of volume, um, Russell futures have just skyrocketed. You know, last year's average daily volume was probably around 150, 160,000 contracts a day. The average daily volume now is well over 200,000 contracts a day. Um, so we're looking up 40% in terms of average daily volume and, and, and Russell futures. And these last couple of weeks, they've gone from uh, trading four and 500 to six and 700,000 contracts a day. So um, customers are getting the liquidity they need. Uh, the markets are are robust. Um, volumes on SIBO have also picked up. Um, you know, interesting is open interest uh, continues to grow, which is a, a very strong confidence indicator of of the market as well. Um, but interesting times, and and I'm answering a lot of questions regarding the volatility within Russell itself and small caps and. Um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we've got some listeners that want to just talk more about uh, the moves in, in small caps. And I know we talked about it last week, but uh, it just continues to be a, a, a tremendous trading opportunity for firms out there or for firms and individuals out there that uh, are interested in, in trading Russell 2000. So uh, uh, that's what I see going on. And that's what I'm hearing. I hope that helps. And you know, the, the, the small cap risk is is very country specific and something that people probably in this environment need to be paying a lot more attention to. And you know, this is triple witching big option expiration week. Uh, seeing a growth in open interest at this time, you know, this time in the calendar shows that people are you know jumping in and using the foot or using the Russell two thousand products to specifically either 
uh, speculate that that we're going to get a rebound in there or hedge against some further weakness. Um, you know, we shouldn't see the open interest going up the way that it is right now, but it is. You know, one of the you know the the R word is being mentioned in our markets today, and I hate to use it on the show, but recession is out there, and you know, small caps uh, are seen to be the leader out of recessions. So maybe this is an indication that, and maybe this is why um, you're you're not seeing as as strong a, a, a pull in to the downside in in Russell 2000 right now is that uh, um, small caps do lead out of recessions uh, and outperform. Uh, to the upside there as well. Um, you know, they, they have higher uh, earnings variability, uh, you know, they're smaller stocks. So you're going to see higher, higher volatility in, in, uh, in uh, small caps like the Russell 2000. So um, um, it's just the nature of the index. Uh, and we, we talk about skew all the time on the show and, and why there's that, that, that sharp skew. But again, there's this tremendous opportunity uh, in trading and, uh, Russell, you're right. The, the the large and increasing open interest is definitely an indicator that uh, one, there's speculation, and two, there's confidence in in investing still, even as as the markets stay as tumultuous as they are. Speaking of outperforming, that that's what the Russell 2000 has been has been doing, both in both directions. <laughs> Listeners, uh, coming into showtime, it was down nearly 40 percent. So outpacing to the downside dramatically. And then as I'm looking at it right now, up nearly 7% today. Yes, I said that right, listeners. 7% on the rut. The, just these, these numbers are, are mind-boggling. We have now a market where the Dow is up about half a percent, S&P up about three-quarters of a percent, NASDAQ up about three, almost three and a half percent, and the Russell 2000 up 7%. So the volatility we're seeing out there is just uh, just crazy town. Let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, coming into showtime, we did see the VIX over 70, the VIX cash. It was a 76 and a half. That puts it up about 11 handles from where it was last show. It has come in a little bit since that's down to about a 69, uh, but still up from last show. The volatility of volatility, a.k.a. the VVIX, how much vol is moving and shaking. Remember, listeners, we talked about that before. Uh, usually bottoms out around 75 or so to the downside. And when it starts getting around 100, you start paying attention. When it starts getting north of 120, look out. All bets are off. We're at 177 right now, listen. It's up 23 points from last show, and it got even higher over the course of the week. So, yeah, you got to pay attention to the vol of vol right now. Volatility is – I know it's a sometimes abstract and obtuse concept to wrap your head around, the volatility of volatility, but that is definitely a thing, and it is alive and well and moving and shaking right now. And our old friend RBX, a.k.a. the VIX of the Russell 2000, was at about a 77 coming into showtime. I put it up. 10 handles from the last show. And almost, that meant that spread between the VIX cash and the RBX was almost non existent. They were about a half a point away from each other, which is very bizarre. <laughs> extremely, extremely uh, bizarre out there. So, yeah, weird times are afoot out there. It has widened out a little bit now. It's about, looks like it's swung the other way now with RBX hanging out around 74 and the VIX down about 79. So, it has swung the other way down to five. So, wait five minutes again. When you're pricing things off the cash, they get a little weird. So now it has sprung the other way. Or, but still, uh, crazy stuff out there. Looking out here really quickly out into the Russell 2000 land. Uh, the lion's share of the paper was out here in the, looks like the week three April contract. You know, if you're talking equities, you got to talk weeklies. And they had about 39, almost 40% of the paper. The vol out here, by the way, up nearly 20 handles in this week three contract. 19 and a half points out here let's go to the skew really quickly by the way the big print out here the russell 2000 at 1058 right now the big print in the money puts 1175 puts so maybe somebody we talked before a lot of people were loading up and seemed like trading a lot of far out of the money far out in time puts in the russell 2000 looks like someone deciding to take some of those off because we've blown through a lot of those strikes out here again like i said coming in on 40 odd percent to the downside uh, coming in here this week Looking at the skew really quickly here. The puts were bid 17% rich. Now they are 20% rich to the at the money. The calls were 18.2% cheap. Actually, calls are getting a little bit of a lift. That latter probably not a small part due to the fact that we were up 7% today. Uh, up now down, only down, or I should say only cheap by 12.2% to the at the money. So calls getting a little bit of a bit out here in Russell 2000 land. Mr. Rhodes, I call you the once in future Dr. Vic, so I know you hang your hat in a lot of equity volatility. These are obviously historic times 
from any perspective. Your old stomping grounds in Vixland had a record close earlier this week. You know, there's a lot to unpack here from an overall equity volatility perspective. What is lighting up your tape these days, sir? Well, one thing I did notice, uh, you, and, and you just mentioned it, was that uh, the skew, I mean, it's still tilting to the downside or, or more concerned about the downside with respect to the options on the equity futures. And, and you know, it, it was showing up in the Russell. It was showing up in the S&P. But the, the, the upside on the call side was – it did appear, to use your term, to be catching somewhat of a bid relative to the puts. And yeah, I, I don't want to be the, the person that comes out and says, yes, we've made a bottom. But that's one thing that usually accompanies uh, a bottom in the equity market. Something else that often accompanies it, and it's been a rarity, is when VIX has been at a premium to RVX and they flip flop. Uh, it, you, you should expect the RVX or the Russell 2000 volatility index to be higher than VIX. The only times that they flip around is when there's really a lot of concern in the overall marketplace. And uh, one of the early indications of a return to normalcy would be VIX below RVX. Now, VIX at 69 and RVX at 74, that ain't normal. But I'm trying to put a couple of positive signs out there. Always my go-to for positivity, sir, Mr. Mr. Watson Future. Dr. Vix, my bastion of, all, of uh, positivity. Speaking of putting positivity out there, do you guys want to tackle some of the legion of questions we got, or should we squeeze one more complex in first? What do you guys want to do? Sean, Russell, I'll let you guys choose. What do you guys want to do? I'm, play some I'm good. I'm good. I'm always good to talk to, uh, to, talk to your listeners, so uh, happy to go to the questions. All right. I guess we can dive into some questions. You guys got a lot of them. Let's get into them with some of your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for Futures Options Feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, so let's get into it. A lot of you guys have questions on a lot of topics. A lot of you are chiming in on this, this conversation we had. We were talking about it on the option block earlier here. But we are indeed in historic times right now, listeners. This has never happened before in the history of the U.S. options market that effectively every option you trade right now is going up electronically. And so uh, we asked you guys actually last week, I think it was right around the time of this show last week, we put out a poll to our audience. We said, hey, you know, historic times, both SIBO and CME, shutting down their trading floors. So that means SPX on the SIBO side, Euro dollars on the CME side, two historic legacy pits going fully electronic as well as pretty much everything else you can think of, VIX and a bunch of other stuff out there, everything on CME land. Uh, we asked you guys, what do you think? Is this uh, the end of open outcry? Are you going to see both these exchanges, trading floors eventually reopen? Maybe one or the other reopen? And I was surprised. Our audience was fairly optimistic. They said 56.5% saying both will reopen only about 2% saying only the CME will reopen, a little over 9% saying only the SIBO will reopen. If I had to bet on one of those, I probably would bet on only the SIBO reopening versus only the CME. And uh, just because of CME, SIBO has much more entrenched interest, it seems like, in keeping the floor going for a little bit longer. And then uh, no, open outcry is dead. About a third of you, about 32.5%. So our audience, more optimistic than I thought, but that led to a slew of comments from, and questions and and just insights from a bunch of you. Uh, let's see how many we can squeeze in here. Simon Gold saying, uh, once they figure out euro options, then the floor is done. So, I mean, he means euro dollar options, obviously. And he's talking about CME there. Yeah, that's kind of been the sticking point. That's why I wanted to talk euro dollars on the show today to see how much paper they have going on. And it was closing in on 2 million contracts just today, which is around the ADB. So it doesn't seem like there's been any impediment out there, but... And these are products that do a lot of complicated spreads and, and 
they're able to replicate it electronically, which is impressive. Just think logistically, listeners, of the impact of having to enter in a spread, this leg versus this leg versus this leg versus this month, buy to open, sell the clothes, all the things you have to do to enter into a multi-leg transaction versus picking up the phone, calling the broker in the pit, say, hey, I want this and this and this versus this month tied to this level in the future, go. It's a much easier process, and yet... And no one's really been able to replicate that well electronically, but it seems like they're doing a pretty fair job. A lot of people ask in this, which is kind of interesting, uh, you know, like AJB2010, Robert Morris all have the same kind of question. They effectively say, what the heck is the benefit to having these market makers around? AJB wants to know if the exchanges will use this moment to replace humans. Natural Ease wants to know, do they, do they, a.k.a. the market makers, make any difference? Like I said, this has been an ongoing point of discussion on our network. Chatted about it a little bit earlier I kind of want to get your guys' thoughts on it as well. Also, folks chiming in where they think these floors are going to reopen. Two-year flipper said he thinks the plan is the beginning of May. Another one, Albert Marquez, says he thinks it's four weeks. Then he's heard eight weeks. And Hakua saying he thinks it's the 23rd. That's um, probably not going to happen, Hakua. I'm just going to go out there and say that. Uh, but maybe, Sean, we'll start with you. I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on this. Do you think we'll see, let's say, CME reopen that trading floor anytime soon? And then B, all these people asking, and it's an obvious question. I mean, Robert Morris says this is probably an ignorant question. It's not an ignorant question. It's, it's an obvious question in this market right now. What is, the, what is the role of a floor and a market maker on the floor when you can seem like replicate a lot of this in the electronic environment? I know, Sean, you were concerned in particular about replicating a lot of that complex order flow. Uh, what have you seen so far from that? What are you hearing from the market makers out there? Are they able to do that? And are your fears a little bit assuaged by these numbers we're seeing out there, Sean? You know, uh, I've, I've been talking to lots of uh, market makers and liquidity providers in the last uh, uh, coming last couple of weeks, and asking about uh, uh, one the uh, the information coming from exchanges, two the, uh, the the operations flow from clearing, from a risk perspective, and from a capital perspective, and. Um, is the Fed doing the right things? You know, I'm asking all kinds of, of important questions of our liquidity providers because that is going to overall be what is going to overall control the, their ability to, to make big uh, liquid markets in uh, the various exchange products that trade. And, of course, I, I'm very concerned on the equity side, but I'm also concerned with the entire ecosystem uh, of our exchanges. So I'm, I talk to them a lot. And you know, they all have had uh, uh, this type of plan in place in case it happens uh, to be able to, uh, to, you know, on the equity side, most markets are electronic to begin with. But uh, to be able to even leave their offices and be able to work remotely, um, a lot of these uh these big, big liquidity, liquidity uh, uh, firms, market making firms, have done a tremendous amount of work to have business continuity or BCPs, business continuity plans, in order to weather the uh, ability to trade remotely from environments. And for the most part, firms have been really well prepared and they've made massive, massive investments in having this ability to, to be able to trade remotely. And for the most part, a couple of hiccups here and there with a couple of the firms that I've been talking to, but I would say for the most part, they're getting their money's worth out of th- their BCP plans, their business continuity plans, and still being able to uh, provide that liquidity. Now, for the floor, um, you know, the, 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 the price discovery point in euro dollar options has been the floor, and uh, the business has been – I would say very slowly evolving to an electronic platform. This is going to definitely accelerate that uh, because it's the only place that you can actually get your option order flow done at this point. So I would, I'd probably see an acceleration of the ability to trade more complex trades. And I think there's going to be a, a strong desire to uh, with, with even the liquidity providers to, to accelerate. I don't think the CME is going to, uh, close the floor. I think what they're going to do is continue to talk to their clients and, and give their their clients the options that they want in terms of, no pun intended with the options comment, but they're going to keep the liquidity uh, flowing in the, in the way that uh, customers really want that to trade. And as the business evolves, you know, down the road, CME will make the, the, the decisions that uh, 
uh, clients are asking for it because they, they truly listen to their clients as, as do uh, all of our exchanges, but they are particular about your dollars, your dollar liquidity, and they know how important that floor is for price discovery um, in terms of complex transactions, as you and I have discussed many times. Um, SPX, uh, Russell, uh, Russell Options, RUT on uh, uh, SIBO, uh, the, I, I see the floors uh, staying open there. Uh, there's just such price discovery uh, in those options, and uh, it's the only place where you can trade them. They're exclusive at CBOE, and our RUT complex is uh, uh, obviously very near and dear to me, so I'm keeping my eyes on uh, th- those products as well. But, uh, you know, I'm an old floor trader, so... Um, uh, I was uh, a big part of that and a big part of the transition to an electronic trading platform back in the day um, in, a, in a previous life of mine. So it's, uh, it's an evolution, and I think customers are now going to accelerate and get more comfortable with electronics, but I do still see a, a desire for uh, floor liquidity. Well, you definitely have some skin in that game. You're right. And uh, it sounds like you're in the optimistic camp, like a lot of our audience there, that, uh, that CBO and indeed CME will reopen those uh, those trading floors and it sounds like i mean i know you had some concerns about the complex orders but it sounds like it's getting done which is very impressive maybe some folks scaling back the complexity of some of those orders as well maybe some of the individual size of those trades perhaps not as large overall but still the overall volume is staying pretty much a pace which is kind of interesting mr road same question for you sir you obviously hung your hat for quite a while at another exchange that has quite a legacy floor presence in the SPX. Uh, these days, not so much, but nobody does. <laughs> uh, so I'm curious your thoughts for all of our listeners who are asking, why the heck do we need uh, an in-person kind of human floor market-making presence? What do they bring to the table? If you want to discuss that, have at it. And then B, where do you stand in our poll here of uh, will any of these reopen? Are you like, Sean, you think both were reopen? You think one or the other? Where where do you fall on that, sir? Well, I... I- think that they're they're definitely still needed and but there are firms that have started putting out some really interesting uh request for quote systems where you can throw a complex option or even option on futures order out to a handful of liquidity providers and get a two-sided market in the same way that you would get a two-sided market by throwing something into a pit in the past. And you can do this on, you know, as complex an order as you want. They're just not widely used yet. Uh, There may be an opportunity for the providers of these things to step up right now and say, hey, look, you know, this is this is the time that maybe you should consider changing things over. I do know that one of the exchanges has been considering a similar type, so teaming up with one of these entities and doing a similar type of system, uh, which wouldn't completely replace the floor because the orders would get sent to the floor, but would kind of streamline the process and actually maybe add some anonymity to the process. Uh, as far as whether or not they're going to reopen them, I think they're going to reopen them. Uh, you know, <clears throat> SIBO was in the process of moving their floor Uh, across the street as they move all their employees over to the old post office in June. So, you know, I think maybe they just continue with that plan and maybe not do anything until June. Uh, But CME, I think they're going to bring all those folks back. There's still a a use for that beyond having a backdrop for Santelli on TV. And I I don't think that uh, there are times that we really do want people down there in the middle of trades and I feel like we've gotten through a lot of that volatility already this this past time around. And I think having people on the floor did help in uh, some of the limit down situations to get things reopened maybe a little bit more quickly than a fully electronic system would have. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot to be uh, unpacked there. We can probably keep going on that, but we got to coming up against it here really quickly. We asked you guys just, I think. This morning, actually, and a lot of you guys are already flocking into this one. We said, hey, you know, markets are melting down, volatility skyrocketing. Some folks trying to ride this market down. Others starting to nibble here at long positions, taking advantage of this sell-off. Others stampeding for the exits. Which camp do you find yourselves in right now? Uh, 26% or so saying you're short and riding this market down. So interesting. 
some of the less risk averse of you out there. And then uh, nibbling at long positions over half, 52.3% of you. So some of you are starting to take bites here at these levels, which is kind of interesting. Uh, cash until all this blows over, about 17%. I can't really fault you guys either. These are somewhat unprecedented waters and other coming in right around 5% with some interesting uh, ideas and things like that. Let's just see here really quickly. Other folks chiming in. Um, got some people sharing this, this tweet from the Spectator Index, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. And like we were talking about the crude annihilation earlier, and uh, they, they chimed in. A simple tweet, but when you think of, when you see it in such stark terms like that, it really puts it in perspective. And they tweeted out uh, the crude oil price one month ago, $52. Two weeks ago, $47. One week ago, $32. Now, $23. And when you see that's about we're close to where it is right now. We're a little bit north of that, but still. Uh, when you see it in that kind of stark perspective, it really, it really puts the shocks in the crude and indeed almost every market system right now into very, very stark relief. And that music means our show, unfortunately, is coming to a close. I wish we could go on for many more hours. You guys have lots more questions and a lot to say about a lot of different products out there. Don't worry. A lot of fun stuff hitting the network for you guys to keep you informed, educated, aware, maybe a little bit enlightened and entertained these days, too. I know it's the, these are trying times for us all. So we're here for you here on the old network. We got a podcast for that, so check them out. We got quite a few. But before we go, let me go back around the horn. Let me start with our friend, Mr. Sean, who's hanging out in his tranquil, palatial, tropical abode there in Florida. I guess if you got to be holed up somewhere, Mr. Sean. There are worse places. If folks want to have questions about all the stuff going on in rut, in the options, in the futures, and the volatility, all this stuff, where should they go? What should they do, Sean? Hey, Mark. It's a real pleasure to be on the show. So thanks uh, for having me again. Uh, come uh, come to our website, uh, footsierussell.com, or, or email me directly, smith at footsierussell.com. Happy to talk to you. Uh, uh, happy to exchange emails and information. But check out RUD. Check out Russell 2000 Futures, the RTY product on uh, CME. You'll, you'll be pleasantly surprised with the, with the liquidity you find. Um, but also, you know, this index, up 7% today. I mean, that just tells you that, uh, of the nature of, of small caps and the uh, opportunity to be trading. So uh, uh, keep your eyes out there looking, looking at Russell. Check him out. Footsie Russell, F-T-S-E, Russell.com is the place to go. Or hit him up, S. Smith at Footsie Russell.com. Make him regret giving you his email, listeners. Deluge him with questions and comments. Your thoughts about will the floor come back? What's going to happen to equities, complex trades, all that good stuff? Hit the man up. And if you want to know all things about derivatives research, he's the guy, Mr. Rhodes. If folks want to check out what you're cooking up there, sir, where should they go? What should they do? Uh, EQDerivatives.com. I'm, uh, I'm still easing my way in, uh, but uh, easing my way in a lot quicker than I thought I would be because of what's going on in the market. And then I'm always just putting out stuff that I find interesting uh, on Twitter. I, I'm, I'm getting back out there and being a lot more active on the Twitter uh, with respect to what I'm seeing in the markets. There you go. Hit the man up. On the old Twitters, he is just at Russell Rhodes, two S's, two L's. And it's not Rhodes like a road you drive on, or even Rhodes the Island. It's his own way, R-H-O-A-D-S. Uh, listeners, give the man a follow over there. On behalf of Mr. Rhodes and Sean and the folks over there, put Sienna friends over there at CME Land and indeed myself. I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for Keeping those questions coming, we love to hear from you guys. You guys have a lot of great thoughts, and I know a lot of you guys are a little bit nervous. Those questions coming. We'll talk you off the ledge. We'll see you back here tomorrow for Volatility Views, 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern. Take a little bit of a hiatus for the weekend, but don't worry. There's all stuff on the network on demand. It's all there 24-7 for you listening, so we never leave your side if you need us. And we're back here again live on Monday for the Option Block, and we kick it all off again to Thursday for more of This Week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. 
CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME Group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEGroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options. StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com. <laughs> 